Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness, the podcast dedicated to helping physicians in Michigan turn their professional success into financial success while enjoying life along the way. And now, here are your hosts, Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness. This is Andrew Mushbaugh, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Trent DeBruin. And today, we're going to take a deeper dive on a concept that has been especially relevant this year and will impact everyone multiple times throughout their retirement which is how to manage or fund your retirement lifestyle during periods where the stock and or bond market is declining. And when we reference funding your lifestyle, we use this interchangeably with how to continue your quote unquote retirement paycheck. So we'll take a deeper dive on how to manage your retirement paycheck during periods like what we've experienced recently, but this will also be applicable to the multiple future times you experience temporary periods where your investments are declining. In several ways, this episode can be viewed as a version 2.0 to episode number 40, which we record at the end of 2021, and highlight the importance of lifeboat drills or how to prepare yourself for the inevitable stock market declines. And fast forward nine months later, and since then, we've been experiencing one of those negative periods for both the stock and bond markets. So the reason we view this as 2.0 to podcast episode number 40 is that it focuses on the next part of what you can do once that market environment you're preparing for in your lifeboat drills has actually materialized. And with that in mind, we'll break this episode down into five different parts. Number one is to step back, take a deep breath, and maintain perspective. Number two is to check in and review your retirement projections to see if any changes may be warranted and or what impact this temporary decline has had. Number three is looking at the logistics of cash management and how to continue funding your monthly retirement paycheck. Number four is about capitalizing and taking advantage of the opportunities that market environments like these present and some of the tactical planning. And lastly, number five is projecting out and planning for the future and having a game plan for what you may or may not do and at what point to prepare both mentally and financially for the unknown future. So Trent, why don't you start us off with an overview of step one in the process? Sure. So the first step is to simply pause and take a deep breath. Now, this could be literally taking a deep breath because that does calm you down. But what we're referring to with the deep breath is more of a concept. It's about quieting the negative feelings, emotions, and thoughts that naturally materialize when you see your investment account balances falling, especially in retirement. When the stock and bond markets are falling... It's human nature for fight or flight to kick in because there's a perceived threat to your well-being, regardless of whether it's conscious or subconscious. The extent of this concern may vary over time and with more experience. For example, you may have quote-unquote seen this story before and know how it ends, aka the market eventually will recover, or you may be newer to investing and the fear and negative emotions might be causing you a significant amount of stress on a day-to-day basis. But regardless of where you are with your investment temperament, based on your experience, knowledge, and comfort with investing, I think we can all agree that it's easier to experience these periods when you're saving to your investment accounts as opposed to withdrawing from your investments and relying on them to fund your day-to-day living expenses. In other words, the challenges and emotions around investing and navigating periods of decline for the stock market are amplified in retirement. Having said that, it doesn't mean you have to give in and let this negatively impact you or cause you any unnecessary stress. By acknowledging and accepting the reality of these dynamics, you'll already be in a better position to handle them when they do surface. It's one thing to know about the challenges that will materialize, but to take it a step further, it's helpful to understand how normal these periods are in order to properly manage your expectations and avoid any surprises. If you were to give yourself a pep talk and summarize this in one sentence, it would be, I know the stock market will go down many times throughout my retirement, but I also know it will eventually go back up. We know everyone is different and it can be easier said than done to just tell yourself this and accept it without letting your emotions get involved, so we'll add some numbers for support. On average, the stock market experiences a temporary peak to trough intra-year decline of almost 15% each year a decline of 20% or more, one out of every five years, and a decline of 30% or more, approximately one out of every 10 years. These are the raw statistics about just how normal these events are and the frequency with which they occur, but again, they're just averages, so it's not to say you couldn't experience two consecutive years of 20% or greater declines, for example. Depending on your investment temperament, this may be somewhat of a relief knowing how normal these pullbacks are, or it may cause you even more stress because you'll feel that one of these larger declines is always looming around the corner. However, moving away from the negative statistics to some of the positive ones, despite all these temporary declines over the years, the stock market has done nothing but continue to make new all-time highs over time. So the bad news is that you can't avoid these declines if you're going to invest in the stock market, but the good news is that they don't matter over the long run. 
at least for the patient and disciplined investor. Tying it all together, the main takeaway is that before you do anything else, including addressing any of the other areas we'll walk through next, you want to come at it with a level-headed and objective perspective, ideally while minimizing or removing the negative emotions you may be feeling. Yeah, and like Trent mentioned, we know this is easier said than done, but the hardest part of investing involves managing your own behavior. And we found the best way to do this is by accepting the realities of investing and having the proper perspective and expectations without emotions. After you take that deep breath, you're now in a position to review and check in on how whatever is happening in the markets impacts you and if there's anything within your control you should take action on. As you can likely tell from listening so far, there is a step-by-step approach we recommend. And it's important to bring that back up because the natural tendency is to jump from A to Z, which can result in you jumping to the wrong conclusions on what, if anything, you should be doing. In other words, you want to avoid making a change like buying or selling stocks, cutting your expenses, or any other potential adjustments before having the context of your unique retirement plan. The second step involves that check-in process, which consists of reviewing your retirement projections. And this likely goes without saying, but when you check in, you're reviewing that same retirement projections with lower figures. So inevitably, it's going to look worse than when you ran it with your investment account balances when they were, say, 20% higher. So you're not checking in as a cruel reminder of your temporarily lower investment account balances. You're checking in to see the extent of the impact these temporarily lower investment account balances have on your retirement projections. And the way we approach retirement projections is by utilizing what we call a Monte Carlo analysis. In basic terms, a Monte Carlo analysis runs a thousand simulations to see how many of them result in you having more than $1 left at the end of your life, aka not running out of money. And the reason there are a thousand simulations and why we prefer this for our retirement projections is because it factors in essentially all the possible investment return scenarios. So when you run these Monte Carlo projections, it gives you a score of, say, 89% or 83%, which means of the 1,000 simulations run, 890 or 830 of them resulted in you having more than $1 left at the end of your life. And when we run these retirement projections, we like to target an initial score of 85% because it helps to strike the right balance of enjoying and spending your money today without jeopardizing your financial security in the future. So that's a little background on the starting point of your retirement projections. And by having that 85% as a target, along with running retirement projections in general, you have a baseline to compare where you are relative to where you should be. In other words, if your score is a 99%, well, you are ahead of schedule and or don't need to worry about what's happening in the markets because they haven't impacted you to the point of needing to make any adjustments. This would be the best case scenario, but really anything above that 85% target should feel quote unquote good because it means we're not at the point where changes are warranted or you're at the risk of what's happening to your investments impacting your day-to-day retirement living. Whereas if you're at an 80% score as a result of this market pullback, there is a chance you may need to make adjustments or at least consider and understand what would be required to get you back on track at that 85% score. When looking at these projections, remember the trend is your friend as opposed to any one-time projection you run, so you don't want to overreact either. Which, as a side note, there are several ways you can run retirement projections and ways you can interpret the results of retirement projections, which we won't elaborate on the specific details in this episode, but you can listen to episode number 51 if you want a deeper dive on the nuances of retirement projections. So what you're trying to accomplish in this step number two is to simply assess the actual impact of the market pullback and understand what, if any, changes may be justified or needed to get you back on target. In other words, have the proper context. If you are in your first year or two of retirement, and we're already borderline with your retirement score, or that 85% target, this may be a good time to cut back on some of the discretionary spending or hold off on any larger expenditures if possible. Ideally, you wouldn't have to make any adjustments to your lifestyle, but the reality is you may be in a spot where a small adjustment today can help to prevent a potentially larger adjustment in the future. And typically, it's a small change like cutting back spending by 5% or 10% for a short period of time until the market recovers and eventually continues to make new highs. The purpose of these spending reductions is twofold. One, you lower the stress of the amount you are withdrawing from your investments to avoid the percentage withdrawal rate becoming too high, thus spending down your investment portfolio too quickly. And two, it helps to avoid making investment mistakes, like selling investments at inopportune times, aka when the market is down 10, 15, or 20%. In many ways, these small adjustments are like picking the least dirty shirt in the hamper. You could pick the shirt you wore last week when you ran 10 miles, or you could pick the shirt you wore to the office yesterday. You don't have to be excited about the choice, but it beats the alternative of not having a shirt at all, whether that's today or 20 years from now. Ultimately, this check-in process should give you additional peace of mind during what can otherwise feel like a stressful situation because it allows you to focus on what you can control as opposed to what you cannot, like having unfortunately bad timing with investment returns. 
Exactly. Focusing on what you can control is almost always what smart financial planning and successful investing comes back to. And expanding on that circle of control, once you've assessed where you stand today and made the decision about what, if any, changes are required to keep you on track, you can further explore what actions to take. In other words, once the biggest box is checked off, am I okay? You can move on to how to capitalize on the current environment and make the most of it within the context of your overall plan. By taking advantage of these unique periods, both the good and the bad, you can incrementally help to put yourself in a better position in the future by stretching your money as far as possible, which is in your control. So instead of worrying about whether you should sell this stock or all of your stocks to buy some new investment, or go to cash, then try to buy back into the market once things quote unquote feel better, which almost always results in making mistakes and having less money in your pocket over time, you can focus on the areas that are within your control that will help keep more in your pocket. Now, the obvious caveat to add here is that there are no guarantees with any strategy in the short term, but the planning we're referring to focuses on the long term and what's going to stack the odds most in your favor and work best over that time horizon. We'll elaborate on a few areas, but the first one we'll touch on is the logistics of funding your monthly retirement paycheck and ensuring that it continues to be funded. On that note, we refer to the monthly withdrawal from your investment accounts as one part of your retirement paycheck, although the timing of these withdrawals could be once a month, weekly, or somewhere in between. So the challenge during a market downturn is that you have to find a way to continue funding those monthly withdrawals which takes into account both managing the amount you keep in cash at any given time, as well as how you replenish that cash buffer over time. We like to keep around three to six months worth of required withdrawals in cash because this gives a little runway where you don't have to sell from your investments if the market is temporarily down 5, 10, or 15%. So it helps provide a little cushion and flexibility with the timing of when you sell from your investments to raise more cash. However, we know there will be periods, like what we've experienced this year, where the stock market is down for longer than six months. This is where diversification comes into play. When one of your investments is down or up, you ideally have other investments that offset it and help smooth your overall investment returns over time. Typically, when the stock market is down, bonds tend to be relatively flat or even up, which allows you to sell from bonds during temporary stock market declines rather than selling from stocks while they're down. So that's the ideal scenario. You sell from an investment that is either flat or potentially up, which means you're selling from profits rather than digging into the principal. However, going back to the situation earlier this year, there was a unique period where both stocks and bonds were down in double-digit percentage terms at one point. Knowing that life carries on and your expenses continue each month regardless of what's happening with your investments, you were left with a less-than-ideal choice about how to raise cash to fund your retirement paycheck. There are many different approaches you can use to navigate this, but one that we implemented was more defensive in nature. And by that, I mean we continued to spend down cash without selling investments to replenish the cash when the amount dipped below our three to six month target. By doing this, it gave us more time for the stock and bond markets to recover without forcing us to sell investments at a temporary loss. That was phase one, but eventually there comes a time where you have to raise cash and sell investments because you spent down your cash entirely. So in this case, it goes back to the analogy of picking the least dirty shirt out of the hamper. Ideally, you can avoid selling an investment at a loss, yet sometimes you have to. So to help mitigate this, we would only sell the amount of investments required to fund one to two months worth of living expenses, rather than selling enough to fully replenish the cash buffer all the way back up to six months of living expenses. The overarching strategy here is to stretch out the runway and buy more time to let your investments recover in value before having to sell them. Yeah, it's hard to understate how big of an ally time is when it comes to investing and navigating these periods. So after you take care of and have a plan for managing your retirement paycheck and raising the cash you need to meet your living expenses, you can move on to some of the proactive strategies you can implement to take lemons and make them into lemonade. The three proactive strategies we'll touch on are one, rebalancing your investments, two, making Roth IRA conversions, and three, tax loss harvesting. The first strategy or opportunity I'll elaborate on is rebalancing which is usually the easiest to conceptually understand and see what results in you having more money over time by implementing it. In basic terms, rebalancing consists of buying more of an investment that has relatively underperformed your other investments, whether that's from adding additional cash, like a recurring monthly contribution or a lump sum of cash that you have, or from selling one of your investments that is relatively outperformed. In other words, you are buying low and selling high, 
which at this point, you could quickly become sidetracked or roll your eyes saying, well, duh, I'd like to sell all my investments when they're at their peak and then buy them back when they're at their temporary bottom. So yes, that would be ideal. But unfortunately, there is no magic bell that rings at either of those points. So the next best option is to apply a set of rules or parameters to help you rebalance in the most efficient way over time. To avoid the temptation of market timing, or second guessing if you rebalance into an investment that continues to go down, the evidence shows rebalancing is most effectively implemented by applying a set of rules or target bands outlining when you will buy or sell an investment. For example, you will only sell from your bonds to buy stocks if either of them are more than 5% off the initial target you set in place. By following a set of rules, you allow both positive and negative momentum to run its course with your investments, and then can, in a patient and disciplined way, strike, or for lack of a better word, when the opportunity presents itself to buy a particular investment at an attractive discount. And rebalancing is often the easiest strategy to second guess on or feel like you made a mistake in the short run, i.e. you shouldn't have sold your winner or you should have stayed in cash a little longer because the stock market went down even more after you bought in. However, over time, the trend for the stock market is up. And if you remove the emotions, it's quite clear to see how beneficial this is. Yes, you'd like to buy a stock at $8 versus $10, But if the stock is at $25 in five years, does it really matter if you bought at $8 or $10? Or are you just glad that you bought more at any price that was below $25? The second strategy, which is a little bit more nuanced and isn't applicable to everyone, like rebalancing is, is making Roth IRA conversions. A Roth IRA conversion is a strategy used to lower your overall lifetime tax bill and involves you paying more in taxes today than you'd otherwise have to in exchange for a lower tax burden down the road. What this looks like in practice is moving or converting money from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. You can move cash or investments from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA to complete this strategy, so this doesn't have anything to do with investing, at least directly, and is focused more on the tax benefits. A Roth IRA conversion is beneficial because it allows you to pay taxes on the money today, ideally when you are in a lower tax bracket relative to where you'll be in the future, and subsequently allow that money from here on out to grow tax-free and withdraw that money and its growth tax-free as well, whether that's you or your heirs. There are other benefits, which we elaborate on in episode 45, a deeper dive in Roth IRA conversions, so we won't go in the weeds on the strategy itself, and we'll instead focus on the timing of that strategy. When the market is down, that means your investment account balances are also temporarily down, which makes the timing of implementing this Roth IRA conversion strategy ideal during this period. The reason is simple. You're paying taxes on the conversion of an investment that is temporarily down, say 20%, in exchange for the subsequent growth and then recovery all being tax-free. In other words, if you converted $100,000 of Apple stock when it was down 20%, you were paying taxes on $100,000 regardless, but fast forward two years later, and now Apple stock is up 50%, well, you now have $150,000 in a Roth IRA, all of which is tax-free. Conversely, if you did not take advantage of Roth IRA conversion, and you instead left that same $100,000 of Apple stock in your traditional IRA, you would now have an extra $50,000 tax liability as a result of doing nothing. So as you can likely see, there are a lot of benefits to Roth IRA conversions in general, but the timing of making them during periods where your investments are temporarily down just helps to compound the benefits. And the last main opportunity we'll touch on is tax loss harvesting, which we are intentionally discussing last because it can be confusing and there are several rules you need to be aware of before implementing it to reap the benefits. At the broadest level, tax loss harvesting is selling an investment that is at a temporary loss, aka worth less than what you bought it for, for the tax benefits. So taking advantage of the tax benefits by selling an investment at a loss is the main benefit, but taking a step further, you immediately reinvest the proceeds from the investment you sold at that temporary loss into another similar investment. The reason this second step is important is because you don't want to let the tax tail wag the dog and thus potentially miss out on your investments or similar investments return by remaining in cash. In other words, you don't want to just sell an investment at a loss and sit in cash. Yes, you'll have the same tax benefits regardless of what you do with the investment proceeds, But like I just mentioned, that benefit could be offset by the potential investment returns you may be missing out on by not reinvesting the money. Again, we won't go into the weeds here, but there are several nuances like the wash sale rule that you need to be aware of. And this strategy is only relevant for taxable investment accounts rather than IRAs. Which on that note, along with any of these potential strategies, we always recommend consulting with a legal or tax professional or financial advisor before implementing them to ensure you are handling and reporting everything correctly. Oh, the joys of compliance. We can never forget to add in those fun disclaimers. Absolutely. That's half the reason people tune in, right? No, at least. (laughs) Well, fortunately, we're done with the disclaimers, I think. But what Andrew just walked through are three really important strategies that can make a material difference over time when it comes to growing your overall nest egg and investment portfolio. 
Now, what we'll touch on next is looking out into the future and planning for how or what you'll do going forward based on how the future plays out. And hopefully this goes without saying, but the goal isn't to speculate or predict how the future will play out. It's instead to focus on if X happens, we'll do this. If Y happens, we'll do that. And understand how your situation will change in the future, like Social Security starting at age 70 or required minimum distributions starting at age 72. In other words, it's about having a proactive plan that acts as a guide for the future and incorporates all possible scenarios. And by all possible scenarios, it really comes down to three of them. A, the market goes up from here. B, the market goes down from here. Or C, the market remains about where it is today. That's the overview of what this last step entails. And the benefit of proactive planning for the unknown future is that you can then make decisions based on how things actually play out without emotions evolved, or at least minimizing the impact of them. If the stock market is down 15%, you may have decided to skip over implementing any of the strategies Andrew just discussed. But what if the market goes down another 5% or 10% and is then down 20 to 25% from the last market high? The most important part of this step is coming up with the guidelines or rules for when you'll act and how you'll act if the situation arises. For example, you may have skipped rebalancing your investments when they were down 15%, but you commit to and are comfortable with setting a plan to rebalance your investments if they're down 20% or more. And taking it a step further, you can set additional targets like rebalancing again if they go down 25% or 30%. The goal isn't to perfectly optimize everything with your finances. It's to at least plan to take some positive action that you know will benefit you over time while balancing your own peace of mind and comfort level with these financial decisions. That being said, if you're retired and realized in step two that your retirement projections are still at a 99% score, even with the market decline, you may decide that your quote-unquote plan is to do nothing at all, because adding more to stocks may cause you more stress than the potential financial benefits of rebalancing in that way. In this example, with a 99% score, you have the luxury of making decisions that have nothing to do with the financially optimal approach. And if that helps you avoid the temptation to take the opposite approach, like selling your stocks when they're temporarily down, that would still put you in a better spot than you otherwise would have been in if left to your own devices. So one part of this future planning is deciding when you'll take action or capitalize on some of the various financial planning and investment opportunities that are available to you. But the second part is looking at when you would need to make the adjustments and what those adjustments would be if you did need to make them. As we mentioned earlier, Not everyone has a retirement plan with a 99% score and the luxury of not worrying, or at least not worrying as much, about the financial side of the equation. For those with a retirement score of 85%, the reality is that even though you don't need to make a change today, there may be a point in the future where changes are required or you could risk jeopardizing your future retirement. If you fall in this camp, it's helpful to look ahead to your future goals, a vacation, a new car, paying for college for your grandkids, etc., to see where or what you could potentially cut in the event that changes are required. By doing this proactively and checking in on it periodically, you mentally prepare yourself for the potential future changes and also avoid putting yourself in a position where you get to a future point and need to make an adjustment but aren't sure how to make it work. For example, your car breaks down, but you already put a non-refundable payment down on a big vacation or just made a big contribution to your grandkids' 529 plan. In this scenario, you could certainly make adjustments in other areas if needed, but doing so often results in more stress, and it's nice to be able to avoid it if possible. So I went through a couple examples, like your plan for when to rebalance your investments or what adjustments you'll make to your lifestyle if needed in the future, but the importance of planning ahead goes beyond just the specific tactics, strategies, or adjustments, and is really more of a broader mindset shift. And this mindset shift is about continually trying to focus on the things you can control and planning around the areas you cannot. Typically, you'll have more time in retirement, which is a blessing, but it can also become a curse if you're focused on the wrong things. So the other important area you can control is what you focus on, and you'll be happier keeping that focus on the things you can control. Well, that's everything we wanted to cover today, and hopefully it was helpful to walk through how to navigate and handle your retirement paycheck, along with some of the opportunities during stock market pullbacks. We know every retiree will face multiple periods of stock market declines, So what we discussed today will inevitably impact you at some point. While we are fans of being optimistic where we can, like knowing the stock market will go up over time, you also need to be realistic and have a plan. Similar to setting up an estate plan, it's not fun to think about times like after your death or what to do in a 25% stock market pullback, 
but you'll be in a much better headspace knowing you have a plan ahead of time versus just hoping things will work out without a plan. So to give a quick recap of what we discussed today, number one, take a step back and take a deep breath. Stock market declines are normal and you'll face several of them throughout your retirement. So the goal is to remove or minimize the emotions that naturally come with seeing your investments down 20 to 25% from where they previously were. Number two is looking at whatever is going on in the stock market and applying it to your situation to see what, if any, impact it has on your retirement projections and funding your monthly retirement paycheck and lifestyle. You may not need to make any changes, and that can provide you with some peace of mind, or you may realize a couple small changes can help keep you on the right track and avoid a potentially larger adjustment in the future. Regardless of where you fall, checking in at least gives you the context of how a stock or bond market decline impacts you. Number three is looking at the logistics of how to fund your retirement paycheck and is mainly about cash management and the timing of when to sell your investments to replenish your cash buffer. The main takeaways with cash management and your retirement paycheck is to A, have an initial cushion like three to six months worth of living expenses in cash and B, stretch the runway of how long you can let your investments go before needing to sell them to fund your lifestyle. Number four, during these periods, you can take it a step beyond just trying to quote unquote get by and instead look at how to capitalize. Three strategies you can implement here are rebalancing your investments, making proactive Roth IRA conversions, and tax loss harvesting, all of which will help to increase the amount of money you'll keep into your pocket over time. Number five, lastly, after you have a plan for what to do today, you should then create or have an evolving plan of what you'll do in the future, like when to rebalance, when to change your investment allocation, raise cash for your retirement paycheck, or what changes you'd make if the stock market pullback continues longer than anticipated. Ultimately, it's about focusing on what you can control without emotions and planning around what you can't in the future. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of the show. You can find the show notes at the podcast page of our website, mdwmllc.com slash podcast. And if you have thoughts to share or questions you'd like to have answered, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at mdwmllc.com. Take care, everyone, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to make smart financial decisions? Check out the resources section of MD Wealth Management's website at mdwmllc.com, where you'll find additional knowledge and insight for Michigan physicians, including a blog, ebook, and one page guides. While there, you can also schedule a 15 minute conversation with Andrew and Trent to learn more about what it means to work with the firm and how they serve physicians. If you've enjoyed the content, please leave a review on iTunes and share with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for listening. Andrew Mushba and Trent DeBruin are certified financial planners, principals, and co founders of MD Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm in the state of Michigan. All opinions shared in the show are for general information and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future returns. Please consult with your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before making any decisions. 